Now, we all understand that the body is an entity unto itself. In other words, uh, bodies get hungry. Why do they get hungry? Because there are mechanisms built into us, physically and mentally and so forth, that when the body gets hungry, it tells the stomach, it tells, it, it finds nourishment. A body without nourishment dies. The other aspect of man's being is spirit or breath. And interestingly enough, the Old Testament words in Genesis for breath and spirit are the same. So if there are two of me and two of you and two of every human being, living human being, anything that is living, the spirit side as well as the body side, the spirit side, it has to be nourished. Something has to tell it, just like the body tells us, I need food. It's time to go find some food. We have to be nourished physically and we have to be nourished spiritually. Tell me which part of man died in the garden. The spirit is the part that died. Didn't mean the body wasn't going to die because dying thou shalt die. But the spirit was evidently pushed to the point almost to death and except for grace would have been pushed to death. The prayer of the sinner, just as David prayed back in Psalms, is don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. That prayer was first prayed in the garden. Because Adam and... I mean, it's, it's like if you get hungry... My wife, I have to tell on my wife. I have to use her as an example. If she goes too long and gets hungry, she gets... I can tell when she's really needing to stop and find nourishment. What about Adam and Eve? Were they suffering first from physical loss of physical nourishment or spiritual nourishment? And it was spiritual, of course. But the key was both physical and spiritual. When you and I are dealing with the Bible, are we dealing with the physical or the spiritual? No, the word is... The word is yes. We're dealing with both. Is this referred to as the bread of life? Is Jesus referred to as the bread of life? Yes, yes. So you and I need spiritual nourishment as much as or more so than we need physical nourishment. So Jesus was to be tempted. He's baptized. Now he's going to begin his earthly ministry openly. And he does what? Come on. He refused to eat for how long? 40 days and 40 nights. Well, what, the body needs nourishment. What was the point of starving himself? And that's what fasting is, starving himself. For 40 days and 40 nights. Just say 40 days. What's, what's the point of that? He starved the body, the flesh, in order to nurture the spirit. To make room for the spirit to find nourishment. Now you and I in this world, whether we know it and whether the world knows it or not, are approaching a time when God is going to starve bodies Food's going to get scarce. It's going to get expensive. It's going to get hard to find. God is going to starve the bodies in order to do what? Quicken the spirit. Quicken the mind work of the spirit. 
This is what we're approaching. Now, I want to refer all of this discussion to the black hole conversation and study. The descriptions of what happens to the earth and to people on the earth, whether good or evil, the descriptions recorded in Old and New Testament Scripture, and I say as well in the writings of Ellen White, is clearly referring to the spiritual warfare that is going to take place down here at the end of time. Spiritual open warfare on the planet and in people's lives. This business of a, a black hole having something to do with the end of time and Jesus returning is not only fascinating, it's a revelation if you read and read more and read more about the status of a black hole. Let's take a moment. The black hole is like um, a solar system. It's flat, but it's not flat. It's bulging at the flat part. It's bulging, but it's bulging more at the top. Now you can look, you can't see the black hole, but you can look and observe the effects of the black hole. And the black hole is spinning. If I'm up here, it's spinning this way. If I'm down there, it's spinning the other way. Are you listening? It's all a matter of perception and position. Now what we can observe is not a black hole itself because you can't see a black hole. But what we can see is that out of the north and out of the south, the spiral effect, the spiraling effect, where magnetic and electric material are being whipped into a frenzy. So um, I have some verses of scripture to share this morning. And let's see if they fit and tell us something. I'm in chapter 50 and verse 2 and verse 3 of Isaiah 50. Wherefore, verse 2, when I came, was there no man? Who seems to be talking? When I showed up, there was no man. Now, are we talking about at the beginning in the garden, or are we talking about at the end of a process? Jeremiah says, uh, I looked and there was no man. Wherefore, when I came, was there no man? I'm going on down into verse 2. Behold, at my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a wilderness. Fish stink because there's no water. They die for thirst. Now notice in this context of no man and animal life and fish life and all kinds of living things are dying. In verse 3, I clothe the heavens with what? I clothe the heavens with what? Blackness. I submit to you, this is a description, a a scriptural description of the approach of this black hole. This little black cloud that Ellen White describes. I clothe the heavens with blackness. I make sackcloth their covering. Well, we don't understand all the physics involved here, but uh, what color is sackcloth? It's black, 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 black. Black is sackcloth of hair. I'm in Jeremiah 25. I could, I, there's so much scripture that I could appeal to here, but I'm in Jeremiah 25 if you want to get there. I'm in verse 9. 
there's a reference right in the middle of the verse to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. That's one of the reasons I'm appealing to these verses. We believe, I believe, Nebuchadnezzar is a type. And if there's an appeal to Nebuchadnezzar, it tells us it, this is either back in Babylonian days or at the end. In verse 11 of Jeremiah 25, This whole land shall be a desolation, an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Um, just so you understand, when the children of Israel were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, led away to Babylon. It was Jeremiah the prophet. It was Jeremiah the prophet who said, you're not coming out for 70 years. If Nebuchadnezzar is a, an end of time you can do the math. started the paperwork with the Balfour Declaration in 47, but it was actually law in 1948. The whole land shall be a desolation, verse 11, and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. Tell me who the king of Babylon is. It was Nebuchadnezzar. But in this context, who is it? Of course. You're going to do thus and so. And then something is going to happen and you're going to lose your mind. For how long? For seven years. It shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. Babylon did something against Israel. Yeah, they did. Yeah. They did. Tell me what they did against Israel. Well, they broke the wall down. Yeah, that's happened. What else did they do? And while they were taking, breaking the wall down and taking them captive, what else did they do? They set fire to Solomon's glorious temple and robbed it of what? all the value, and took it where? Did God keep His eye on it? Did God know where the, the treasures of the temple were taken? And so there was one Belshazzar who was the last king of Babylon. And what made him the last king of Babylon? He called for a big party. Big party. Big party. Our big party deserves gold to drink out of. I want you to uh, look at this Jeremiah 20, did I say 25? It's 23. And verse 19 and 20. I want you to see these verses. Behold, let's do it on the board. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he has executed, until ye have he has performed the thoughts of his heart. And of course, we don't know when this is going to happen. There's no way to know when it's going to happen. God loves to just sneak up on people. The scripture says God will not allow these kinds of things to happen without first telling the prophets to tell the people. In the latter days, ye shall consider it. Is that where the verse ends? Ye shall consider it what? 
perfectly. The scripture is so full of information. Now I'm in Isaiah 24, and I want to invite you to go there because there are several verses in Isaiah 24 that we really want to take note of. Was Isaiah the prophet of uh, the plan of salvation? Yes, he was. He's, he's the one that over and over and over again prophesied of those things that had to do with Messiah. He's also a prophet of the end. So I'm in Isaiah 24 and verse 1. I'm not going to read this whole chapter, but a good portion of it. Isaiah 24, 1, Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty, makes it waste, turns it upside down, and scatters abroad the inhabitants. If you make the earth empty, empty of what? Devoid of what? Life. If you turn it upside down, something has to be going on cosmically to flip the earth. Verse 3, the land shall be utterly emptied. Emptied of what? Utterly spoiled. Spoiled of what? For the Lord has spoken this word. Verse 5, the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws. The laws of the land are the laws of heaven. They have transgressed the laws. They have changed the ordinance and broken the everlasting covenant. Now let's just bring that concept down to Revelation. There's a law that the nations are going to make and declare that every person has to be obedient to the law of the land. And in order for that to happen, will they change the ordinance? Which ordinance? And broken the everlasting covenant. I'm, that's in Isaiah 24, 1, 3, and 5. Now I want to continue in Isaiah 24 because this just, the, the picture is, you can't miss it. In verses 16, 17, and 18, I shouldn't take time to read all of this, but it's worth reading. From the uttermost part of the earth, we've heard songs, even glory to the righteous. But I said, my leanness, my leanness, woe unto me, the treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Yea, the treacherous dealer have dealt, have dealt very treacherously. Fear and the pit and the snare are come upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. In Revelation 6, we have the picture of the kings of the earth, the mighty men, the proud. They see something coming up there, and they're trying to hide down here. So they call for something to fall on them, the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them. They would rather be crushed by a rock than look at the face of God. That's what it says. Face. Verse 19. Now this is where I want to ask you to follow very closely. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. What, what kind of force would it take to break up the whole planet? The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. Something cosmically has to be going on to shake, rattle, and roll the planet. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. It shall be removed like a cottage. The transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. They shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shut up in prison. And after many days, tell me about the many days. After many days, how about a thousand years? After many days, they shall be visited. 
Then the moon shall be confounded. Now wait a minute. What does that mean, moon confounded? How do you see the moon? There has to be light reflected on the moon from the sun. The moon shall be confounded. That means turned black, blackened, darkened. And the sun shall be brighter than... No, it says the sun shall be ashamed. How do you make the sun ashamed? Something has to hide it. How about a black hole competing? Then the moon shall be confounded, the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before His ancients gloriously. Let's go back to Jeremiah for a moment, please, while we're here in this part of the Bible. I'm in uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, just a few verses. I'm going to start in verse 23. You have to get a picture of the cosmic upset, the cosmic shaking that is going on and what could possibly cause it. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. Here we go to darkness again. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. Oh, this is a description of creation. No, this is a description of the end of creation. I beheld the mountains, and they, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. All the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by His fierce anger. What is His fierce anger? It's called the wrath of God. What is it? Hide us from the face of Him that comes. And it is spoken of, for the great day of His wrath has come. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be de desolate, yet I will not make a full end. For this, for this shall the earth mourn, the heavens above be full of light, because I have spoken it. Is that what it says? The heavens above will be black, because I have spoken it. I have purposed it and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen, the bowmen. They shall go into the thickets and climb on the rocks. Here's where uh, Revelation 6 is taken, right here. They shall go into thickets and climb upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, not a man dwell there. And when thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou closest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rendest thy face with painting, this is the Jezebel experience. In vain shalt thou make thyself for fair. Thy lovers will despise thee and seek your life. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in travail, and the anguish as of her that bringeth forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hands, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is wearied because of murderers. We see the context. These are vivid pictures. 1 John, New Testament. This gets even more interesting as far as I'm concerned. 1 John in the New Testament. That's over next to Revelation. John is a first grade reader and first grade writer. Chapter 3 of 1 John and verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. I say that's, uh, that, that phrase is key, sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not because it knew Him not. Verse 2. Now beloved, beloved, Beloved are those who are the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we're going to be. But we know that when He shall appear, we're talking about Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven, when He shall appear, 
we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So we have, we have a scripture record of Jesus as a man and Jesus as a resurrected man. What's the difference between the two? He was flesh and blood as a man. But the resurrected Jesus is not flesh and blood. He's flesh and what? Come on. Thomas, come here. Feel me. A spirit doesn't have flesh and what? Bone, as you see me have. There is a difference between the Jesus before he was resurrected, dead and resurrected, and the Jesus after his resurrection. And whatever he became is what we are going to become. So we're going to keep the flesh side of man, though it's not going to need blood to energize it. What does it need to be energized? The water of the river and the tree of life. You know, the simple stories of Scripture are the ones that are most powerful and most beautiful. I read quite often chapter 4 of John, and that's the woman at the well. She was a pagan. She was a heathen. According to the Jews, she was a dog. And yet Jesus, who refused to reveal himself plainly, openly to the Jews, says to this woman, I'm the one you're looking for. You remember the story, I think we all do, but it won't, won't hurt. Woman, give me water to drink. And then they went through this whole exchange of, I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew. Samaritans don't have anything to do with Jews, and Jews don't have anything to do with Samaritans. I come here to draw water. You don't even have something to draw water with. And you're asking me for water? You remember the reply of Jesus? Woman, I love it. Woman, if you knew who it was that was asking you for a drink of water, you would be asking him for water. Because the water that I can give will well up into thee a spring of life. That's what's going on here. That's what's going on here. We're going to be like him. But we need access to the river of life and the tree of life to be like Him. It has something to do with resurrection. I'm in Revelation chapter 6. Just to refresh you real quick on what happens. Revelation 6, 12 and onward, I beheld when He had opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake. That's cosmic a great earthquake. The sun became light and overall glorious. It became, the sun became black. Here is the purest, plainest evidence that a black hole is approaching this rock and the people on it. The sun will become black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. Well, it's a process. When the lights go out, they will go out on the moon as well. The stars of heaven fell into the earth. That's a cosmic event. Even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. There's your shaking of Isaiah 24. Verse 14, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. You ought to read Peter on that. Roll back rolled back. How, did, how, how is that accomplished physically, cosmically? How is that accomplished? Well, if you have a black hole, as it draws near the earth, the atmosphere is starts with a hole and enlarges. The heavens departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. Every mountain and island were moved out of their places. 
the kings of the earth, the great men, rich men, chief captains, mighty men, every bondman, every free man, hid themselves in the dens and rocks of the mountains. You see, you, ha you have to reason. There's a place for reason in reading the scripture. God cannot destroy the wicked if they have not had a plain, thus saith the Lord. I mean plain, 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 thus saith the Lord. As plain as Adam and Eve heard it in the garden. And here is a, 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 a description of a group of people who are going to be lost. They are going to be destroyed at the brightness of His coming, only to be wakened a thousand years later to be destroyed again. How can that be? Because Jesus said, I'm going to tell you this, listen to me. There has to come a preaching. There's a message that has to go to every kindred tongue, nation, and people. Here's some of the kindred tongue and nation right here. It has to be, they have to hear the good news. The gospel, it says, that's good news. Good news of what? Now, according to most of Christianity, it's the good news that Jesus came. It's the good news that Jesus died. It's good news that Jesus woke up. That's as far as they go. The good news, according to Jesus, is the news that the kingdom of heaven is where? Is at hand, is come. They hid themselves, verse 15, in the dens and rocks of the mountains, and they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Old Testament prophets speak of the wrath of God as His fierce anger. In Revelation chapter 10, if you want to go forward three or four chapters, in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 4, we have these words. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal it up. Don't write it down. Now when you and I read that, you have only two choices. To say, okay, okay, or to become angry. Because God is hiding stuff from us. I was two going on three. And... Ms. Whelan, can Charles come out and play? I was two or three. No, I wasn't. I went out in my house, felt house slippers and a house coat. John M. Caldwell was seven or eight years old. He came all the way around to where I live. Ms. Whelan, can Charles come out and play? So we got in the backyard. My mother, unfortunately, was busy doing household chores. And John M. Caldwell had a box of matches and he was striking and throwing, striking and throwing and laughing. <laughs> he said, you can do one. You want to do one? I struck it and threw it and burned 150 acres off. If I had been old enough, they would have put me where? in jail. And they would have held who responsible for paying the bill. But he's just a kid. You don't, there's information you don't share with two and three year olds. Right? Down here are human beings two and three year olds. Yes, we are. We don't know our head from a hole in the ground. The angel I saw stand upon the sea and the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and he swore by him that lives forever and ever who created heaven, the things therein, the earth, and the things therein, and the sea, and the things therein, that there should be what no longer. Now how do you stop time? Depends on which clock you're keeping time with. 
And the way we keep time down here is with the sun and the moon. Everybody on the rock keeps time with the sun and the moon. So the sun and the moon are going to turn what? Turn off. Dark. That's how you stop time. You just change the order of events with the sun and the moon. There should be time no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, and that's the archangel, according to Paul. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be what? E.D. Finished. E.D. As he hath declared to his servants the prophets. You know, if, if you were to take all of the verses Old and New Testament and Scripture that fit what's going on here, it'd take you hours to read it all, much less comprehend it. I'm back to Matthew 24. This is Jesus. This is red letter. So find it. Matthew 24. Verse 29, 30, 35, and 36. Immediately, whatever that means, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Here's our cosmic Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus repeated this when? At his trial. Just before they were to put him to death. Show us some sign that you are... Show us, show us, give us a sign. And he said, you'll not be given a sign, but I'm going to tell you something. Hereafter, whatever that means, after this, hereafter, you're going to see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. You can read about it in Daniel 12. The clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 35 and 36. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Uh-oh, where did they go? They've been kicked out of their orbits. Something has changed. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Not just shaken. They're going to be moved. Jesus says heaven and earth are going to pass away, but my words are not. Of that day and hour, no man knows. No, not the angels of heaven. And in, in Acts 1, he says, I don't even know but my Father only. What a picture. What a picture. I wish Hollywood could produce something like this. Scare the britches off of a lot of folk who need their britches scared off. In Revelation 19, Jesus is coming. Armies of heaven following Him. Verse 17, I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice. He's crying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. It's so interesting, Old and New Testament. There's no human beings left alive. The last living creatures that appear to be here are the buzzards, the flesh-eating, carrion-eating birds. Old Testament and New Testament. Right here's New Testament. Come and gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, captains, flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and them that sit on them, flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. That's a different study. The beast was taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire 
burning with brimstone. You want to compare that with Revelation chapter 9, star falling from heaven, angel with a key to the bottomless pit, and smoke ascending out of the bottomless pit. Verse 21, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat on the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. One more. I'm in Ecclesiastes. I think you'd appreciate seeing these verses. In Ecclesiastes, Old Testament, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 3. This is an evil. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun. That there is one event unto all, yea, also the hearts of the Son of Men is full of evil. Madness is in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. Verse 5, continuing. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know everything. Verse 5. The living know they shall die, but the dead know not anything. You could say, they don't know nothing. They know not anything. Neither have there any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Well, what happened to the sun? It was removed. I wish there were an easy place I could turn. I have so much trouble right now collecting my thoughts and putting things together as they should be together. I wish there were some simple place I could turn among Jews or Christians or Bible students of whatever background where these things were put together in the order that they belong in. There's a picture here, and the picture is at once full of fear, frightening. That's what it says in Revelation 6. It's, it's frightening, but at the other side of this reading and story, the righteous hear the angel singing, and Ellen White says, they unite their voices with the heavenly choirs. Some people are going to see Jesus come and say, the great day of the Lord has come. And others are going to see Jesus coming and they're going to say, the great day of the Lord has come. With much fear and trepidation. I just want to take two minutes more and remind you of the black hole experience. So Simeon, if you don't mind, just one per family. In, in the human experience, there are races of people. Some are brown, some are black, some are white, some are yellow, some are red. I don't know about blue. Thank you, I have one. There are races of men. If we study the heavens with our telescopes and our instruments, we discover that there are races of stars. There are yellow stars, suns, there are orange suns, there are red suns, there are blue suns, there are black suns, there are brown suns, there are white suns. Literally, literally, literally. Now the color of a star is a history, a living history of what it's composed of and what it has been through and how long it has been living and how much longer it may live. 
just by looking at the color of a sun or a star. The smaller these suns appear could be an indication that they have lived a long life and they are beginning to, like an old person, skinny down. The thing about a sun is that um, it changes its physical being. Suns, as they age, they begin to explode and blow away a good part of their mass. And as that mass is gone, what's left is, becomes more compact and makes it heavier because it's concentrated, it's more concentrated, more concentrated, more concentrated. You need to know that in all of the stars, blue, red, yellow, orange, whatever, the black ones are the heavy ones. The black ones are the heavy weighters. Now you can have a black hole that's a fraction, 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 fraction of the size of the moon. And it can swallow up not only our sun and our moon, but the planets in our solar system. It's, it could be that strong, that forceful. So something has to happen according to Jesus' words and the words of the prophets. Something has to happen some entity has to come into our part of the solar system and it has to shake the sun and the moon. I believe it's a brown dwarf. I believe black hole, brown dwarf is the counter to our sun. 51% of all the stars that are out there, 51% have a companion star. It is believed by many that we're, our sun has a companion star. That may be a brown dwarf, which as it approaches becomes darker, more intense. Or we could be signaling with all the things that are going on. So let me say this. This last week, no, this week, there was a tremendous earthquake in the Caribbean, in the Gulf of Mexico. Tremendous earthquake, a 7.4. That's big. What many people, what many ordinary people do not know is that associated with that earthquake, it was expected by the experts to, the consequence would be several tsunamis in the Caribbean. Now that was based not only on the strength of the quake, 7.4, but it was based also on its location. But there was one other thing I want you to listen that happened. To my knowledge, nothing like this has ever happened in my lifetime. The reason there was fear among the experts, the seismologists, that tsunamis would follow is because around the Caribbean, um, the water began to go out. Pensacola, Florida, the water went out in the bay. No, not all of it, but enough to lay bare um, in Belize over here on the Mexican side, the water went out. People were fearful. They were afraid the tsunami was coming back. This happened in numerous places around the Gulf of Mexico. Tell me where the water went. Well, it, it, it left the West Coast, and that means it all went to the East Coast. No, on the East Coast, it was falling back as well. On the North Coast, it's falling back. We don't know about the South. 
tell me where the water went. Now this was an event the evident, that evidenced the fracture that drained this water back was not simply mantle. The fracture was not simply in the upper layers, but down in the plate level, tectonic. There are things happening to and on this planet and in the heavens that stir the minds of, how does Ellen White say it? Thinking men and women have their, I'll read it and we shall go. A storm is coming, relentless in its fury, thinking men and women have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. They're watching the relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity taking possession of every earthly element. Sinkholes all over the world. I'm 76. There was never a time earlier in my life that there were sinkholes all over the world. Something is disturbing the cosmos that we live in. They're watching the relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity taking possession of every earthly element. They recognize something great and decisive is about to take place. That the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. So if I'm made of flesh, that's my body. That's me. That's this. And you can come along and say, don't worry about it. I do worry about it. If I get hungry and can't find food, I worry about it. If I get sick or I'm pained or whatever, I worry. I'm sorry, I'm human. I'm sorry, I'm flesh. The only way I maintain that Jesus and his people down through the ages have ever stood against the pain of the flesh is the strength of the Spirit. It's the only way. Faith. Now, I believe in faith. I have a measure. I believe in faith. I love to talk about faith. But my faith gets as far as uh, which thousandth year will all of this come to pass? Maybe we can narrow it down to which century now? Maybe we can narrow it down to which year now? That's where we are. Father in heaven, thank you that you understand we are mere flesh. Mere flesh. But we are said to be sons and daughters of the Most High. We are said to be shaped in the form of God. You made us for a purpose. Satan came and interfered with your purpose. And we, with you, are paying an awful price, waiting, 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 waiting to be delivered. The things that are taking place in the heavens and on the earth and in, the, in and among the nations suggest that time is short now, very short. Thank you for blessing us and our families. This is the time for your spirit to draw us together. Thank you for your work, your goodness, your promises, which are so sure. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.